Okay. Um, I am very uh, fond of listening to sermons, <laughs> and sometimes with the teachers that I listen to, they'll do something uh, a little different, a little um, off what their norm is, and that's a, a question and answer session. I like listening to the question and answer sessions. They're very enjoyable, helpful. I learn a lot there. And as I've listened throughout the years to these Q&As, it doesn't really matter who I'm listening to, it seems like one, one question um, seems to come up, particularly with, uh, obviously these are unbelievers who are asking this question, but it, it, it says something like this, if a Christian dies when they're in the middle of sinning or on their way to go sin, will they still go to heaven? Now, obviously, we know that there's a problem with the theology of this question, but there's, there's a concern in that question that uh, I think is, is necessary to look at. This idea of your last moments and what you're doing in those last moments is a, is a deep-rooted fear in a lot of people, and um, it, it made me think about something when I was growing up and what we're going to look at today. I remember when I would grow up as a child, and uh, my, my mother and my father would tell us, because there was eight of us, they would tell us, uh, when we get home, whoever has their room clean is going to go with us to the toy store and, um, you know, to McDonald's or something like that. Whoever does not have their room clean when we get home, not only are you not going to the toy store, but you're going to get a spanking. Um, and so they would leave. And so, you know, I figured they'd be gone for a few hours or so, so I'd kick back, watch some cartoons. You know, I figured I still had time. I'd say, you know, about 30 minutes before I figured them coming, then I'd get to work. But it never failed. As I'd be lounging on the couch with my feet up, I would start to hear the screeching brakes of my family's old car, and my heart would begin to pound because I knew time was short. And so I'd jump up as soon as I could and start frantically trying to clean my room and I would hear the door slam on the car and now my palms are sweating and I'm trying to make my bed and push stuff in the closet and I'd hear the footsteps up to the door and the key inside and the door jingle and at this point I'm just a nervous wreck and I know it's too late. There's nothing I can do. I don't have enough time to do what I was told to do and I'm stuck. And it, Undoubtedly, what would happen is the consequence that they told me would happen, and I would, as I'm sniffling, with the sting still on my backside, I'd watch my family drive off to the toy store while I'd be home. I want to talk to you about something very serious, something so serious that Jesus talked about it in several parables dealing with this issue of what I just told you in that illustration. You can find it in the parable of the talents, at the end, he said, when, when the master came, the parable of the wedding feast, he talks about when the king came and called everyone in, the parable of the ten virgins, there were five with oil, five without, and the bridegroom came, when the master of the house, there was a parable of the servant in charge of the house, and it says, when the master of the house came, the parable of the doorkeeper, if a servant knew when the thief was coming, he would have Watch. Over and over again, Jesus talked about his coming. Yet, with this strong emphasis made by Christ, many Christians don't really even think about it that much, let alone tell others about this reality. Even ask yourself in your evangelism how often do you talk about the reality that Christ is coming? Christ did, the apostles did, do we? Now, perhaps because of your eschatology or your end times view, you have a, a, a view that you know, the temple has to be built and the Antichrist has to come and all this type of stuff happens. And so maybe you're not thinking that way. But I'll say this quickly. If your view of end times causes you to hear the words that Christ said with urgency and it causes you to diminish that urgency, you need to abandon that eschatology. If Christ said it with urgency, then it's an urgency that we need to look at it with. Um, but that's another issue for another day. I want to talk to you about this, and I want to ask this question. The question is the title of this sermon. What will you be caught doing when he returns? 
Turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 35. What will you be caught doing when he returns? Luke 12, 35. Says this. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of believers at time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him much will be required and from him to whom they entrusted much they will demand the more. So we see here in these first verses, 35, uh, uh, we're, we're going to see a theme, a repetitive theme, okay? Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Verse 36, be like men who are waiting for their master so that they may open the door. Verse 37, those who he finds awake, dress himself. Verse 38, again, finds them awake. Verse 39, would not have left his house to be broken into. Verse 40, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus emphasized and re-emphasized the seriousness of this issue of being ready for when he comes. So starting with verse 35, stay dressed for action. Get this picture of staying dressed for action. I was watching this documentary about Pearl Harbor and, uh, you know, I, the, the, the documentary, as it sometimes does, has reenactments. And so it had this reenactment because it happened on a Sunday, uh, you know, afternoon, morning kind of thing. And the, the soldiers were unaware. They, so they were just relaxing. Some were playing cards, listening to music, writing letters. They were just chilling because it was Sunday. They weren't at war. There was nothing to worry about. So they were just kind of lounging around in their pajamas and things like that. And then the bombs started dropping. There was no time to get dressed. There was no time to react. They ran out, and whatever they were dressed in, that's what they ran outside with. Christ tells us to stay dressed for action. Some of y'all know Brother Juan. He's a fireman, and he let us go to the, the firehouse one time, and he showed us how the firemen put on their, their outfit. And they have such a uniform that it's, it's meant for quick action. So you can get this idea that they're laying in their bed, the alarm goes off, and they quickly, in a matter of seconds, are dressed for action. Christ tells us this is the idea here, that you're, you're staying dressed for action. You're, you're quick, you're ready. And then he says, keep your lamps burning. Now, we're not used to it this day. We just flip a switch, the light comes on. But during this time, they had oil lamps, and they had to light these lamps, and it took time. And you can imagine that if you're in need of light and it's dark, well, that might not be very helpful to have of the Lord that's not lit. Christ tells us, stay dressed for action, keep your lamps burning. Why? Because he's coming back, and you need to be ready. There's this famous saying, we'll keep the light on for you. It's this idea of keeping the light on, being ready, staying dressed for his return. 
Have things ready. Or will you be caught undressed and without your lamp? Now, this will be enough of an example. Stay dressed, keep your lamps burning. That will be enough to get the point, but he doesn't stop there. He brings in another example. He continues and says, be like men who are waiting for their master so that they may open the door for him. So we're to be dressed for action, lamps burning, and our hands on the doorknob, as it were, waiting for the master. Now, I, I, you know, I painted that picture of when I was growing up, and you, I got, you got that idea. You got, I'm hearing the, the door slam and the walk and the jiggle and all that, and it's, I knew their arrival was close. And Christ is telling us we need to be like people who are waiting for the arrival of our master, ready to open the door. I don't doubt that there's a person in here who has not been a part of this context and that you've been in a room, maybe the lights are huddled in a corner or everyone has their hiding spot and everyone's waiting for the door. It's a surprise party, right? You're waiting. Everyone has the same focus. We're waiting. We're looking at the door. We're keeping our ears out. Somebody's the lookout. Somebody's the contact person letting us know when the person who's coming is close. And what happens? They're close. They're close. Everyone, get ready. Get ready. And everyone gets to their place, and everyone's ready. Their minds are focused. They're ready to do that thing. But has it ever happened that the lookout didn't look out, and they walked in on you all and caught you unprepared? All oh, the surprise is ruined. Well, that's not a big deal. We're just talking about saying happy birthday to somebody. But Christ is saying, be ready as though the master is approaching. Is in the New Testament. Serious things. The reality is some people will not be ready because they won't be dressed for action. They won't have their lamps burning. They won't be keeping their eye out for the master's return. And this is no small thing. The warnings are great. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He keeps on going and brings in another analogy, the analogy of being awake when the master comes. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service. Being awake. This idea of oversleeping and missing the arrival, missing the coming of the master. You think about the disciples who fell asleep during the greatest prayer meeting of history. When Christ came to them, he found them sleeping. Three times he found them sleeping. What a thing. What a shame. Here we have Christ telling us of the blessedness of being awake when he comes. Now that display, right? The final coming, thankfully, for the disciples, and they were literally sleeping. But Christ is giving us a picture here. You don't want to oversleep. You want to be awake. You want to be ready. You want to have your eyes on the door. You want to be dressed. You want to have your lamps burning. And then he gives another picture. Look at verse 39. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. This idea of a thief. Why a thief? Because the thieves don't tell you when they're coming, right? We had our home uh, broken into, if you will. They stole our TV. They didn't call me and say, hey, uh, I'm planning on coming about 3 a.m. Does that work for you? They didn't do that. Thieves don't do that. It's this idea of stealth. They come when you don't expect. They come when you're not thinking they're coming. And this is exactly the reference point that Christ is referring to. That you need to be ready because you don't know when he's coming. The next verse says that. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. He's telling us, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Repeatedly, analogy after analogy after analogy. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I'm coming when you are not expecting. Be ready. Then Peter asked the question that some here may be asking, some may be thinking. He says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Because sometimes we do that, right? If I uh, if I said, you know, what, I'm going to be preaching about disciplining your children. Well, those people without children would maybe turn me off. I don't have children. I don't need to listen to this. We're going to be talking about. How to use your singleness for the glory of God. Married people, I don't need to listen to this, right? Sometimes we say that. Are you preaching this for me or for everyone? 
But look at what Christ says. Look at his response. Sobering. He doesn't say, yeah, for you or for them. He basically just gives us two groups. When he returns, you will either be found doing what he said or doing what he forbids. That's it. He doesn't say, well, Peter, after all, you are a disciple and these are the other disciples. So no, this doesn't apply to you. No, he just lays out two groups. You're either going to be a faithful, you're going to be with the faithful servants or you're going to be with the wicked servants. And that's what I want to lay out for you today. Two groups. Which one are you going to be in when he comes? So let's look at the faithful servant. Verse 42, and the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? That's the question. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. So this is the faithful and wise servant. The faithful and wise servant lives in such a way as if his master could come at any time and he wants to be ready and obedient when he comes. This is the Christian. This is the true Christian. Earlier Christ spoke of being dressed for action. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you think about the reality of the two problems of humanity, two problems. One, everyone is born sinful, imperfect. Christ demands perfection. The, the standard of God is perfection. We are born imperfect, and we continue in this direction. We have a heart that is a magnet that is attracted to sin. We are naturally rebels, children of wrath. We love sin. We enjoy wickedness, and we go full-fledged into it. He prayed to the filth and mire of disobedience. That is our bent. That is our nature. That is who we are as people. That's how we are born into this world. And that is a problem when a holy, holy, holy God demands perfection, righteousness. That's a problem. Problem number two is because of all of this disobedience, because of all this wickedness, because of all this evil that dwells within us and we act out with our hands, our feet, our minds, our eyes, there's a consequence to pay. And we're guilty. So not only do we have the problem of being imperfect, being unrighteous, we also have the problem of being guilty, being condemned, and having the punishment of God hanging over our heads. Well, what does Christ do? He comes and solves both problems. Whereas we as people lived wickedly doing all manner of ungodliness, Knowing that those who do such things deserve to die, we not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's our reality. Christ comes and lives perfectly, always obeying the Father, never displeasing him. Every moment of every day was spent righteously. He fulfilled the law down to the smallest iota, down to the smallest jot and tittle, if you will. He did everything right, fulfilling perfect righteousness. And then what does he do? He surrenders his life. He lays down his life. And upon a cross, he takes the wrath and punishment of Almighty God, fulfilling the satisfaction of God's anger, propitiation. He anger, he satisfied the righteous requirement that the law brought down on those who will believe. And he rises from the dead. And all who believe are given the righteousness of Christ, so they have their problem number one solved, and they have their condemnation removed, placed upon Christ. It was, it was a big part of a problem number two solved. So what does all I have to do with this? The, the fact that the Christian is to be dressed for action, what are we to be dressed in? <laughs> the robes of righteousness. And where do we get our righteousness? From Christ. Isn't that what Revelation tells us, that we are to, we're wearing the white robes, and these robes are the righteous deeds of the saints, but where do we get our righteous deeds from? What did Paul say? Christ. It is Christ who lives in me. The things that I do, it's Christ who's doing them through me. I worked hard on it all, but it's God who's working in me. 
In Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the armor of God. You look at all the, 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 the pieces, if you will, of the armor of God, and who do they point back to? The belt of truth. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Our feet are be shod with the gospel of peace. We have peace with God through the gospel because of who? Christ. We're to wear the breastplate of righteousness. Where is our righteousness found? Christ. The helmet of salvation. Who is our salvation found in? Christ. The shield of faith. Where are we to have our faith in? Christ. It's all about Christ. We're to be dressed in Christ. That's where we find protection. That's where we find salvation. To be dressed is to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ and ready for action. Not idle, but doing the work that God has called us to. Like it says in uh, Ephesians uh, 2, we are his workmanship created for God in uh, sorry, we are his workmanship created for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're to have our lamps burning. My brother Kevin came to me with Psalm 92.10 talking about the oil, fresh oil covering us. These lamps were burning with oil. We know this. This is certainly a picture of the Spirit of God within us. Shall we be found like the virgins without oil? Shall our lamps go out due to quenching the Spirit of God? God is light. He dwells in unapproachable light. His light, his life is the light of men. That faithful servant is the Christian who waits for his master's return and is pleased to serve in humble obedience while he waits. The person is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. His lamp is burning with the spirit of God dwelling within. His eyes are on the door. His ears are listening for his master's footsteps. He's awake and ready. Like 2 Peter 1.3 tells us his divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. That covers everything, doesn't it? Everything is supplied by Christ. We're dwelling in faithful obedience. We're ready to go. Christ says the one who lives this way is blessed. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Blessed are those servants. We've heard of other blessed servants, right? Other blessed men. You got Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor st stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. It's the same person. The blessed one who is ready for his master, the blessed one who is dressed and ready for action, the, the blessed one who has the lamp of the, of the Spirit of God burning within him, the blessed one who is obedient and faithful and will be found faithful is the same blessed one who is not walking in the way of sinners, not standing in the, in, in the way of sinners, not sitting in the seat of scoffers, but he's meditating on the law day and night. Truly, this is the blessed man. This is the Christian. The same blessed man who's dressed for action. The Spirit of God is a, is, a, is, a, is a lamp burning within us that shines in this dark world, living with a clear conscience, nothing hidden. I mean, isn't this what lamps do? Don't they expose things that are trying to hide in the dark? No, it's true that some lights are burning brighter than others, and Right now in your walk, you may be feeling weak. You may be struggling. You may not be at the place where you feel like, man, I see others and they just seem to be shining bright and I feel like I'm, I'm holding on by a thread. But you're holding on. The light is still burning. I remember being at the, the men's retreat recently and I had my sons and our flashlight had some, it was a dollar store flashlight with dollar store batteries. And so the, the, the light wasn't very bright. But that light... <laughs> We were walking back to our tent, and we saw raised roots from the trees, and we avoided those, and we saw tent pegs with the, with the strings, and we avoided those. It wasn't, the light wasn't burning as bright as some of the LED lights that some of the brethren had, but we were still able to see. And if you're feeling like, I'm struggling, I'm barely holding on, you continue to hold on. You keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Don't let that light go out. Don't go back to the world. Don't, don't fall away. You keep your eyes fixed. It gets hard, you run to him. He's faithful and true, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. So, though the world tempts you at times, you stumble, this is the truth. 
But the cry of your heart is you delight in the law of the Lord and on this law you meditate day and night. Your cry, the de desire and the passion of your heart is that, the, is that the Lord is the desire of your heart. You want him. You want to please him. Truly, this is the same blessed man from the Beatitudes, the one who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness, the one who is meek, the poor in spirit, the one who's mourning over their sin, the one who's showing mercy, who will receive mercy. It's the same person that receives the title of blessed by Christ for doing his master's will, even when the master is away. Secondly, he describes the wicked servant. Now, this is not merely the, the one who's disobedient. For we all stumble at, with disobedience at times. But this is the servant who says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, so let me do evil. That, that's a very different mindset. This is the hypocrite. This is the servant who acts one way in the presence of his master, but acts contrary to the will of his master when he is absent. In fact, he actually capitalizes on the fact that he has alone time. He says to himself, the coast is clear. He's gone. Now I can do what I want. I remember going to school and I would see girls get on the bus with a certain outfit. They would get to school and they'd come out of the bathroom wearing a different outfit. Why? Because they wanted to appear one way in front of their parents. But when they were out of the view of their parents' eyes, they said, now I'm free to be me. I'm sure you've all been driving maybe to work or somewhere else, and you come across those dreaded brake lights. Everyone's brake lights are coming, and you're like, oh, what's going on now? And so you're wondering maybe it's an accident or something, only to find up as you inch, inch, inch that there was a policeman driving along. What happened? Suddenly, everyone wanted to obey the law. But once they were out of the view of the policeman, zoom, they go. Why? Because they don't want to obey the law. They are only doing it because the eyes of the law are on them. But once the eye of the master is gone, now I can do what I really want to do. This is the wicked servant. We're talking about hypocrisy. Jesus warned about this hypocrisy earlier in the chapter. Chapter 12, verse 1, look, it says, In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another... He began to say to his disciples, first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. The Pharisees looked very good in public. They prayed in public long. They liked to fast in public. They liked to give in public. They would cross land and sea to make one convert in public. But inwardly, they were dead men's bones. Inwardly, they were a brood of vipers. Inwardly, it was all manner of death and wickedness. Behind closed doors, they would devour widows' houses. Behind closed doors, they were conspiring together. How can we cause Christ to stumble in his words? Behind closed doors, they were conspiring together. How can we kill him? But they would not do anything openly because the people perceived him as a prophet. In the view of everyone else, they behaved one way. Behind closed doors, they were free to be them. This is the wicked servant. Christ warned us, beware of practicing your deeds before men like the hypocrites. It's all eye service. It's all a show. This wicked servant knew his master did not want him beating the slaves and feasting and drinking and getting drunk. He knew this. Yet, since his master wasn't there, he did what he wanted to do. He thought, the master won't know. I'm smarter than he is. I'll fool him as I have before. Because again, you got to think about it. He would not be working for the master if the master knew he was always doing these things. He's not going to hire someone who signs up and say, hey, I'm very good at beating slaves and getting drunk. He's not going to hire someone like that. He appeared one way in the master's view. But once the master was gone, he said, now he's delayed in coming. Let me be me. 
And we, we've seen this before. I have, I have a cousin, some of y'all know my testimony, I had some, obviously we all have wickedness in our lives, but, you know, I, I live with my cousin, and my cousin, he sold drugs. That's what he did. He was very good at it. He did it for years until he got caught. Now, selling drugs is not something you do in public. In public, he wanted to appear to be a law-abiding citizen, but he was not. He did these things behind closed doors, in back alleys, in closed rooms. And then what was done in the dark, he was caught. In, uh, in Houston, they, they talked about these teachers who were cheating. They were helping students with their tests. In appearance of everyone else, this is an outstanding school. Look at their scores. They must be diligent and faithful to teach these kids. But they were caught cheating. Whatever you do when no one is around, that's who you are. Don't fool yourself. Don't pretend that, well, I'm in front of other people and so that's who I really am. No, it's when no one else is watching. It's when, the, when those eyes of the people who you care so much about their opinion, when their eyes are not on you, so in church, oh yeah, I'm oh yeah, I'm a nice man, I'm a good husband, nice father, but behind closed doors, cruel, mean, ungodly. Pray great in the prayer meetings, but alone you don't even want to pray over your food. What is the reality of your life? Because Christ is coming and he's going to catch you doing what you always do. That's the point. You're not going to fool him by, well, my master's delayed in coming, so he won't know. No, he's going to catch you doing what you always do. What will you be caught doing? Jesus said it. Basically, you're either going to be verse 43. Christians who are, who are 46. So you got verse 43. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And then you have verse 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. That's what it boils down to. You're either going to be found in verse 43 or you're going to be found in verse 46. Either way, you're going to get caught. But you're either going to be caught doing what the Lord commands or you're going to be caught doing what the Lord forbids. Will you be caught obeying or will you be caught disobeying? Christ says, blessed is that servant. Versus the one that's going to be cut in pieces and put with the unfaithful. Remember, this is the response that Jesus gave to Peter's question. Is this for us? This is for everybody. In Mark, in, in Mark's uh, account of this, he says, What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Other translations, be awake, be alert. What I say to you, I say to everyone. Be awake, be alert, watch. Why? Because you don't know when I'm coming, and I'm coming. Be ready. serious now obviously we know he can come in his final return that is the context of this passage that's the context of the parables that I mentioned earlier the the the, the talents the the uh, the virgins but he can come to you in another way can he uh, I was in the back talking with brother Matt about Paul Crouch founder of TBN the Lord came for him. Y'all know Paul Walker, fast and furious, died in a car accident of all things. The Lord came for him. Nelson Mandela, the Lord came for him. He can come in his coming or he can come for you. But make no mistake, he's coming. At the end of the day, he's coming. And when he comes, what will you be found doing? Now, if you know the will of the Lord, and you say to yourself, Christ is merciful, it'll be okay. The servant in the parable said to himself one thing, 
And that thing that he said to himself allowed him to justify his sin. My master's delayed in coming. Let me sin. You may say to yourself, well, God forgives. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? But if you say to yourself, well, God's merciful. God forgives. It'll be okay. God knows my heart. You make excuses to dive into your sin, and you would not be doing so if the eyes of those who you value their opinion of were on you. But behind closed doors, you're doing something entirely different. You're willingly going away from the will of your master. You're intentionally saying to yourself, since no one will see me, I'm going to indulge as if Christ himself does not see you. He who has made the eye, does he not see? He who has made the ear, doesn't he hear? He does. And I'm saying that if you die when you're committing a sin that you're going to hell? No, I'm saying this. I'm saying what Jesus said. What will you be found so doing when he returns? Christ didn't remove any of the urgency, any of the warning because of Peter's question. In fact, he brought it home even more. Will he return while you're holding on to unforgiveness, fully aware that he says, unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven? Is that how, he, is that how he's going to find you? Will he return while you are fornicating, knowing that no fornicators will inherit the kingdom of God? Is that how he's going to find you? Nor drunkards, nor homosexuals, nor idolaters. Will he find you holding on to your, idol holding on to your idolatry, holding on, saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to keep on getting drunk and I'll repent later. Is that how he will find you? Will he find you rebelling against the authority, fully aware that he says, no authority comes unless it is given by God. And those who resist authority resist God and will incur a judgment. Will he find you so doing? Will he find you lying or stealing or worshiping your image? Will he find you in the backseat of a car doing what is forbidden? Will you be found guilty? Would you, will you be found looking at pornography when he comes? God forbid, may it never be. Will he find you trusting in the filthy rags of your own works, knowing that our best deeds are as filthy rags? Will he find you trying to earn salvation, trying to earn forgiveness through your religious efforts when you know that no one is righteous, not even one, no one does good? Will he find you saying to yourself, well, no one will know if I do this. When he who made the eye sees everything. If he, if he comes and finds you doing these things, there's, there's no explanation. You're not going to have a conversation about this. There's no second chance. This isn't a video game. You're not going to get another life. This isn't a do-over. It's over. If he comes and finds you in your sin, that's it. You will be cut in pieces and put with the unfaithful. That's what he said to Peter and all the disciples. This warning goes out to all. What will he find you so doing? Or will he find you faithful? Will he come upon you as you're in prayer or loving others? Will he come at a time when you're forgiving someone who's wronged you? Will he come at a time when you're repenting? Because you've sinned? Will he come at a time when you're mourning because you've shamed his name? Will he come at a time when you're weeping over your sin? Will he come at a time when you're reading his precious word? Will he come at a time when you're serving someone else? Will he come at a time when you are worshiping in spirit and truth? How will he find you, brethren? How will he find us? Will he come at a time when you're gossiping? Or will he come at a time when you're stopping gossip in its tracks? I'm not talking about works righteousness. I'm not saying that, listen, if you're a believer, you have eternal life. If you're a believer, you, there, there is no perishing. You will not be put to shame if you trust in him. But know this, that many people said, I trust in him, I believe in him, and they will stand before him on that last day saying all manner of things, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness, I caught you. I found you unfaithful. 
What did he say to those in the talents? Thy good and faithful servant. This is about having a heart to do the master's will. This is about having a heart that is fixed on pleasing the Lord at all times. Even when you fall into sin, you have a heart that is bent and fixed. I want to please you. Lord, the worst day I have is when I shame you. My heart breaks for my sin. I want to be free from this. You're like what it says in Romans. Thank you. This morning together with creation. You want to be free from this bondage of decay. You want to be free from this flesh. You want to be with him. You don't want to shame him anymore. Is that you open? Or is the cry of your heart, no one's looking. Now I can be me. Now I can get away with what I really want. Those who are dressed in the righteousness of Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Your hand is on the door, ready, you're looking, you're waiting, you're excited, you're saying Maranatha, you want him to come because you want to be with him, you want to spend eternity with him, and yet you say like Paul, it's far better for me to remain here because I want to do more work, I want to love the church, that's another evidence of being a believer that you love the brethren, you love him, you love the church, you have a love for the lost, you want people to be saved. What will you be caught doing? Now listen, if you know right now, as I'm closing, you know that you've been living the life of the wicked servant. You have been putting on a front. You have everybody here fooled. You have deceived everyone. You've been accepted into membership. You've been baptized. You have everyone fooled. But you know it's false. You know it's a lie. You know it's not true. Because when you get alone, you're different. You're someone else and you know it. If this is the reality of your life, look at the mercy of God that he has not taken you like he took Paul Walker. He has not taken you like he took Paul Crouch. He has not taken you like he took Nelson Mandela. You're still breathing and you've heard this message. Repent. Repent even where you sit. Turn from that thing. Remove your idols from your heart. Turn to Christ in faith. Let go of this facade. Let go of the reputation. Let go of the name and turn to Christ in faith. Look to him and he's merciful. He will save you if you come in faith. Don't listen to this message and go back to the dark. For Christ said, whatever is done in the dark is going to be exposed. You're not going to get away with it. You can fool everyone, and even on your deathbed, you can have everyone fooled, but you will stand before the master. You will stand before his blinding, holy light, and there is no lie, no facade, no mask that you can wear that will hide the reality of the truth that you were unfaithful, and he knows, but his righteousness is pure enough. His blood is sufficient enough. His grace is eternal enough to forgive you of all of your sins, to grant you the righteousness that you do not have, to pardon you and to take the wrath that is hanging above your head even now. He's faithful if you will come to him. And those who are truly saved you don't want to come slipping into complacency. You don't want him to come when you're quieting your conscience so you can indulge in the lust of the flesh. You don't want him to come and, and find that. You don't, want, you don't want him to come and you're right in the middle of sin and your face is now red with shame. You don't want that to be the reality. Yeah, you'll be with him, but don't you want him to come and for him to find you faithfully doing what he commanded? Isn't that what we desire? We don't want him to show up and like, oh, man, if I would have just not decided to give into the flesh now, I believe he can come at any time. He said, be ready. You don't know when he comes. Do you think he can come right now? Do you think he can come tonight? Is that the reality of your thinking? Is that the reality of your doctrine of eschatology that you don't know when he can come? And he said, be ready because you don't know and I'm coming. Well, he's coming soon. And I don't know when. But I want to be found with a faithful that is ready for his coming. Father, 
Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you would even give us warnings like this. Thank you, God, for your kindness. Lord, I pray that those who have been pretending, those who have been wearing the mask of the hypocrite, Lord, that you would give grace, that they would tear that mask from their face, exposing themselves before you in truth and honesty, and that you would give them grace to be your faithful disciples who will have a clear conscience living before you in integrity. And Father, those who are truly yours, but have been stumbling. Those whose lamps are burning, but they feel as though their lamps are burning dim. They feel as though they're barely holding on. Lord, would you give grace? Would you open their eyes to see more of the beauty of Christ, that their hearts may be burdened with more love, more desire, blazing with more love for you, that they would, found, they would find themselves only desiring to do your will at all times. Help us, Father. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen.